This is Talk of the Nation. I'm Neil Conan in New York City today. In 2007, Wall Street Journal reporter Robert Frank introduced us to Richistan, where inhabitants wore million-dollar watches and sneered at $50,000 cars. Times have changed. Today, Frank returns with a new book, The High Beta Rich, and joins us here at our bureau in New York. Nice to have you with us. Good to be here. And in your last book, I learned about shadow yachts, the uh, ships that follow the yachts of the super rich. They have some place to keep their helicopters and their cars and their submarines. In this book, I learned another new phrase, zombie jets. What's a zombie jet? A zombie jet is a jet that has been purchased by a person that at one point was worth somewhere $100 million, maybe $200 million, maybe a $1 billion, and they borrowed the money to buy the jet. And then jet prices fell, their own fortunes fell, and basically the jets were upside down. They were worth less than the actual loan value. So the banks didn't want them back. The people who owned them didn't want them back. So as a result, you've got all these jets that are flying around, thousands of them, private jets, that the owners haven't been able to pay for and the banks don't want back. And this illustrates a world where, well, we often think in the words of the, words of the old song, the rich get rich and the poor get poorer. That is not really the case. That's right. You know, I, before I started this book, I just assumed that, that wealth was like an escalator in America, that the 1% were always just getting richer and the rest of us were not. In fact, when I started to look at both the people and the statistics on wealth, what I learned is that the 1% has become the most volatile and unsteady part of our economy, that you have these people crashing in and out of the 1% um, due to the, the changing nature of the way wealth is created today, but also the culture of spending and borrowing that we've seen on things like shadow yachts and zombie jets. And that, well, give us an example. There's a, a couple that you profile. Uh, this is Tim and Edra Blixis. Yeah, they were a couple that I had first looked at in Richestan. They were billionaires. They made their money from a resort called the Yellowstone Club, which is a private golf and ski resort that counted Bill Gates as a member. And they had a personal household staff of 110 people, they had three private jets. They had two yachts. And, you know, they told me they would never have to worry about money again. Well, flash forward, I visited them in 2000. They had divorced. Each have filed for Chapter 7 bankruptcy, which means liquidation. So she had zero. The, the jets were gone. The planes were gone. The uh, yachts were gone. And I was in her 30,000-square-foot mansion where she's all alone. And... We were looking at the fish tank, which used to be this huge fish tank filled with coral, and it was empty. And I said, Eater, what happened to the fish tank? And she said, well, the, the fish coral got repossessed because I couldn't pay the monthly fee. And so, you know, looking at that fish tank made me wonder, how does somebody in America go from a billion to zero? And what does that say about wealth today? So I proceeded to then interview other people. Maybe they didn't go from a billion to zero, but some of them went to 100 million to 10 million, one guy who went from 10 million to zero, um, to really look at this, this new era of, of the high beta rich. And not that we should feel sorry for them, and nor do they deserve necessarily that little uh, snicker of schadenfreude that I, I just erupted when the, the coral got uh, <laughs> repossessed. But nevertheless, uh, why should the rest of us care? Uh, that somebody who had a billion and a half now only has a half a billion. I mean, it's a big loss, but so what? Well, one reason is that they're just great stories. I mean, some of the people I interviewed, there was a couple that built the largest home in America until they ran out of money. And, you know, I profile, how does that happen? It was a you know, 90,000 square foot house. That's Tiger Woods neighbors down at Versailles. Yeah, exactly. Their house was called Versailles. Um, and, and uh, you know, the, there's, there's a profile of a repo man who goes around and uh, takes the jets and yachts of the, the formerly rich. So these were just great stories. And first and foremost, you know, I believe that a story has to be you know, worth telling, worth reading with great characters. But there are also some financial lessons from these people. I think that some of us learn best from extremes. And I think you know, for me personally, I learned a lot financially from looking at how these people who, again, had so much money and didn't think they'd ever have to worry about it again, um, borrowed, spent, and, you know, drove themselves into the ground. And, and what you learn is that, you know, debt can be very dangerous no matter how much you have, that spending levels um, should be modest for people, and that we always misprice risk in our lives. We always assume, okay, worst case scenario, 
my house will be worth 50% of what it is now. When in fact, a lot of these people, their assets fell by 80 or 90%. So we, we tend to misprice risk in our lives. But the real reason we should care is that there's this whole body of research that suggests that more and more of our economy is tied to this top 1%. So they pay the bulk of the taxes, you know, 40% of the nation's income taxes are paid by the top 1%. If you look at California, New York, other states, it's it's a little higher. It's not an argument whether that's enough or not, but Yeah, no, exactly. It's just but, a fact. but but you know, the sad fact is as the wealthy have become more volatile, uh, the contagion from that group will be felt by the rest of us. We're talking uh, with uh, Robert Frank about his book. Uh, the uh, uh, I have it right here. It's The High Beta Rich. If you'd like to join the conversation about the rich and the formerly rich, how they made and lost their fortunes, why the rest of us should care, give us a call. 800-989-8255. Email us, talk at npr.org. You can also join the conversation at our website. That's at npr.org. Click on Talk of the Nation. Later in the program, back to the 99% and where the Occupy movement goes after Wall Street. You can send us email on that now if you'd like. The address is talk at npr.org again. But back to Robert Frank and uh, uh, the full title of his book, The High Beta Rich, Why the Unstable Super Wealthy Will Lead Us to the Next Boom, Bubble, and Bust. And in fact, you suggest some of those uh, booms and bubbles are being inflated right now. Absolutely. I mean, you know, when you look back at the 1% or the wealthy, however you want to define them, before 1982, they were the flat line on the income scale. They were the most conservative in America. When times were good in America, the 1% didn't do quite as well. When times were bad, they didn't do as badly as everyone else. Suddenly in 1982, the year I call the magic year for wealth, the 1%, which used to be like the teetotalers of our economy, became the binge drinkers. And when times were good, they did two or three times better than everyone else. When times were bad, they did two or three times worse. So if you look at the last three recessions, the top 1% lost two to three times in income what the rest of, of America lost. And you know, part of it has to do with more and more of today's wealth is tied to the stock market, whether it's executives who are paid in stock or somebody who's starting a company and takes it public with an IPO. And the stock market is more than 20 times as volatile as the real economy. So before 1982, wealth came from inheritance or oil or land, real estate, some kind of steady asset. Well, After let me ask you to illustrate stocks. that with the story of a family that you tell in the book, uh, uh, the, uh, the Stearns. Uh, this is a family fortune that begins in the 1920s, a boom cycle. And this is a, 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 a German man who comes over with absolutely not a dime to his name, but a, a boatload of canaries. That's right. Max Stern came over with some singing German canaries. That was all he had. And he started selling them to all the department stores. He did very well. And eventually, these people buying the canaries needed food. So he started selling uh, bird food and pet food. And so it became the Hart's pet empire, which is flea collars and puppy chews and all the things that they make. One day, Eddie Stern, who's the grandson, went to his father, Leonard Stern, and said, Dad, why do we need to make anything? In this economy today, this is the 1990s, we can make money just from trading, just from money. So let's get rid of this pet food business and just start trading money. So they started a hedge fund, and now the family is really just making money from money rather than making things. And that's really the story of today's 1%. And there's another family. Uh, you tell their story. And this is uh, an Irish family, the, uh, uh, the story of the, uh, the Mars. Yeah, the Mars were uh, – they started a cargo shipping operation in New Jersey. Three generations they worked hard on the docks, loading and unloading cargo from, from vessels. And they sold the company and immediately invested the money with several banks, including Lehman Brothers. And as soon as they – invested the money that they got from selling the business, $200 million of it was lost by Lehman Brothers. And so many families, so many wealthy families in the past 10, 20 years sold their businesses what's called a liquidity event, <laughs> which means you have this <laughs> Another sudden, wonderful phrase. Yeah, you have this sudden pile of cash from selling your business, and a lot of that's finance-driven. And they invested it and immediately lost you know, probably 20, 30 years' worth of work. And what that shows is that 
many families that own companies since World War II thought that they were doing the smart thing by selling their business and getting this pile of cash. They could just live on the investment when, in fact, it's a very dangerous financial world out there. Again, our book is The High Beta Rich. Our guest is Robert Frank, 800-989-8255. Email talk at npr.org.